The C500 Mark II is an incredible camera with a 6K RAW sensor, an amazingly simple menu layout, an incredible intuitive touchscreen, and a fantastic stabilized sensor. I'm not going to do a full review of the camera because there's plenty of those online already. But one of the things I do want to focus on is one of the camera's flaws, its crop sensor slow motion capabilities. In short, the 120p is only usable in very controlled scenarios. But if you want to find out why and compare it to a few other options on the market, stick around to see the tests. I'm Simon and welcome to the Power Boys. I have a C300 Mark II which I've been using for the last four years. It's an amazing workhorse, but an obvious drawback was the lack of 4K50 that always gave the FS7 the edge. Now personally I always preferred the look and the colours of the C300 to the FS7, but each to their own. The C300 Mark II did shoot up to 100 frames a second, but in the cropped sensor mode. The C300 Mark II was the Super 35 sensor and cropped to Super 16. I tried it out and the results really were not usable, and as you can see in the examples here, it's grainy even on a bright sunny day like this, and there's the obvious drawback of the crop sensor and therefore needing to switch to wider lenses. That crop really does generate quite a lot of noise, as opposed to here, this is the 25 frames a second using the full Super 35 sensor of the camera, and if we just look at those on a side by side when using this crop. The noise is so much noticeably worse on the 100 frames a second and really wouldn't be usable and this is in bright daylight environments. Jump ahead to now 2020 and I've picked up the C500 Mark II. Of course we're now working with a full frame sensor which is around 1.3 times wider on the field of view than the C300 Mark II. Here's a quick side by side of the two cameras with the same lens on. The lens I'm using is a Canon 35mm f1.4. The specs of the C500 Mark II look pretty amazing, and although it's not a cheap camera, it's pretty well future-proof with things like 6K RAW recording. However, there's one pretty major drawback of the camera, and that's its slow motion recording options. We've now got the 4K 50 that the FS7 had years ago, but if we want to go above 50, the camera crops in. And it doesn't just crop into Super 35, it crops in all the way to Super 16. That's a two times crop factor on the full frame sensor. I gave some Canon reps a pretty hard time about this, especially after the announcement of the C300 Mark III, a noticeably cheaper camera that shares most of the same specs and of course the same body shape as the C500 Mark II, but without the full frame. However, that camera does have the ability to use its full Super 35 sensor for 120 frames per second. I appreciate their different sensors and different processors and different cameras for different purposes, but I, along with a lot of other early adopters of the C500 Mark II, felt fairly disappointed about this. That said, the C500 Mark II is still a solid camera, and while I can't do a direct comparison between the C500 Mark II and the C300 Mark III, I can compare it with some of the other cameras that I've got here that can also record in frame rates above 100 frames a second, which is the Panasonic Lumix S1 and the Arri Alexa Mini. So first off, just a quick sharpness test, using the same Canon 35mm lens on all three cameras, shooting at 125 frames a second on the Panasonic S1 here at f4, and it looks reasonably sharp. When we crop in in a second, you'll see that it does lose a bit of sharpness right in the edges. Moving on to a 35mm sensor on the Alexa Mini, so obviously it's noticeably a lot closer on the field of view. And finally the C500 Mark II, which is using a Super 16 crop of the sensor to get to 120 frames a second. Each camera is set to its native ISO, so that's 800 for the C500 and the Mini, and 640 for the S1. All other settings are identical, f-stop and distance from the subject. So if we have a look on this side by side, the C500 is not looking too bad. The sharpness is definitely a lot better than the Panasonic, but it doesn't quite hold the same detail all the way to the center of our focus chart as the Alexa Mini. And now moving on to a second test, filming outdoors in the bright sunlight. This is the C500 Mark II shooting the full frame sensor at 4K 50p. It looks pretty glorious. And now here it is in the Super 16 crop shooting at 100 frames a second. It doesn't look terrible, but if we crop into 400% we can see that the noise does greatly increase, especially in the shadows. Here's a side by side of the 50 frames a second and the 120 frames a second. Now moving on to the Panasonic S1, again here's the 4K50 footage, I'm recording internally so it's the H.264 SD card footage. With the S1 I'm using a variable ND screwed onto the front of the lens to try and match the wide aperture of the C500 with its internal ND. When shooting in 50p it's a 4K Super 35 crop and 8-bit colour, 
Whereas when shooting at 125 frames a second, it's the full frame of the sensor, but it's only full HD and still in 8-bit. And finally, here's the Alexa Mini. There isn't much of a surprise that it looks pretty glorious in every frame recording option. Of course, the Mini is not a true 4K camera. It records in 3.2K and upscales, but switching now from the 50p to the 100p, it still looks really beautiful. And now some movement tests. You can see the C500 does look great when it's got so much natural light as we have here. Even in the shadows, it doesn't look too bad. Although it is worth bearing in mind that this huge crop massively limits the shooting options that you've got. So at the minute we're on the C500 and it's a really nice close-up of my dog Isla, but when we go to the Panasonic S1, this is the field of view when using a full frame sensor, so the difference is really night and day, it's so much wider and obviously much easier to get wide shots when using a camera like the S1 as opposed to the C500 if we're using these high frame rates. All were shot in their respective log formats and I then colour corrected them from a LUT in Premiere to get them to match to each other as close as possible. And hey, just because we can, let's throw in a little 200p from the Alexa Mini. Because YouTube doesn't have enough videos of dogs running in slow motion. So that's the outdoor tests, and here's a side-by-side. -side. We can see the Alexa Mini, of course, does have the best picture. And that's to be expected with a camera that's so much more expensive than the others. That said to me, the C500 is not looking too bad here, especially if we look in the shadows, there's a lot of clear detail, it's not too noisy. The fact that it's a much closer field of view obviously is not ideal, but if we compare it to the Panasonic S1 on a closer frame, the noise is much worse on the S1 than the C500, so when you're dealing with an outdoor bright daylight situation like this, the 120 frames a second is looking quite nice. Now that was the easy test for the camera. To give them a bit of a harder time, let's test them in less ideal circumstances. It's quite dark in this room, but there's some daylight out the window, so a bit of a dynamic range push. This is where the reduced bitrate and processing of the Panasonic S1 really shows itself to not be up to the standard of the other cameras. If you have a look at the noise on the wall, it's much more grainy than the other cameras. It really doesn't look that usable to me. The capabilities of the Mini are coming out really well again here. The wall really doesn't look that noisy at all, and it's handling the highlights and the lowlights really well. Now moving on to the C500, the noise looks absolutely terrible here, and I can't see this being usable at all. Really surprising to compare that even with the C300 Mark II, the noise is much better on the C300 Mark II. Both of these shots were perfectly focused, and you can see that the C300 Mark II doesn't look quite as sharp as the C500, but the noise is so much better on that back wall on the 300 than on the 500. So if we have a look at these side by side, you can see the C500 there really doesn't look like you're getting usable footage. And so I think just to take a closer look at the results that we've had here, this is the C500 Mark II again, and I've exposed the darkest corner of the wall to 10% on the waveform. So it's really quite dark at this stage. And I'm using the Canon 35mm f1.4 lens, but I've set it to f2 so that it's not too shallow. So really we should be looking at some sharp footage here. Here it is at 10% exposed to the darkest area, and the noise does look pretty bad on the back wall there. But in the next test, I've brought it up up to 20% exposure on that back wall. I'm just using an Aladdin all-in-two light, so just increasing the intensity of the LED. And already, actually, this is looking much better than that previous test. There's still a lot of noise in the wall, but I think that's to be expected when you're shooting indoors in low light. Now, if we swap to 30% exposure on the wall, the noise is noticeably better, and at 40%, it looks a lot better again. And so here, those are our side by side. And we do get to a point where this is possibly usable on that wall there. It does look a little bit noisy, but I think you'd probably get away with it in a pinch if you had to. 
So in conclusion, I don't think the 120p on the C500 Mark II is brilliant, but if you are in controlled environments and you're able to really make sure that you're lighting your subjects properly, it is something that can be used. If we keep on at a Canon, it's maybe something that they can change in firmware to be able to use the Super 35 crop for 100 frames a second, rather than the Super 16 crop. Although they have said it's a limitation of the sensor and the processor, and they've implied it might not be possible in firmware. Uh, at this time, we don't know. So the C500 Mark II's sensor and processor was dictated and designed to give full frame functionality of the 60p. So that's where the processing power has been put to. It's not going to stop me trying. It does seem strange for Canon to alienate a huge proportion of their cinema camera clients with the C300 Mark III, a cheaper camera that was announced and released just six months after the C500 Mark II. There will of course never be a camera that's perfect for all purposes, but for me so far the C500 Mark II is ticking a lot of the boxes. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if there's anything else you'd like to see in the future, be sure to send us a message. Thanks for watching.